Robin Wilson, Bonnie Brooks, Gwen McMahon. Hello, thank you for the opportunity to speak. I'm Gwen McMahon. I've been a first grade teacher for seven and a half years and SOP for the communication model for nearly 21 years. This model is a therapeutic approach and is very, very successful. Normally I can dismiss a, at least five to six students per year and they enter kindergarten not needing any services and this allows them to keep focused on their academics. I brought with me thank you cards from families for the past only 10 years of my career. They not only thank me for how successful their child has become, but there are thank you cards for when they have entered K through five, middle school, crediting our program, giving them the foundation that they needed to be successful in their academic career. Last week, or a couple of weeks ago, my principal received her budget and she informed me that the communication model was cut from the budget and my returning students would now receive their services through a VE classroom bearing exceptionalities. And a letter was sent home and there were other options included. And this is the letter that went home. Um, I have 37 students on my caseload, new students about to um, enter any day, and nice students that I serve in the VPK unit. Placing my returning students in a VE setting is not their least restrictive environment. The VE units have developmentally delayed students, which could mean, that, which does mean that they, um, the child's chronological age could be about three, but they perform at the age of two or one year old. This um, change for the half-time and full-time VE units is a place where all student, all disabled students, in this, will be placed in the same unit instead of having separate place classes, excuse me, specific to their disability as we have now. The composition of the class uh, that is coming is going to range from behavior, intellectually impaired, developmentally delayed, to speech and language impaired. The change is not allowing the students to be placed in their least restrictive environment. It is not beneficial for our children. I wrote an email to Mr. McCormick with my concerns and he very quickly responded um, he explained to me that um, pardon me, at this point we have 11 ESE pre-K program models and have the need to reduce the number, uh, number of models offered. I have a concern with this as we will be, um, that we will now be like mushing all our children together and we will mm -hmm. not be placing them in a setting that would promote their success. It would only be chaotic. As I do not know the school board's policies and procedures. Oh, sorry. I thank you for my time. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm just going to go through this as using my reading because I can't wing it. <laughs> my name is Bonnie Brooks, um, and I am one of the speech and language pathologists currently working in one of these communication models along with Glenn. And the main reason I'm here is that they're going to cut all of these, there's between 14 and 16 units. Um, the first 20 years of my career, I made an impact working in middle and high school um, as a speech and language pathologist. But I must tell you, the last three years of my career working in the communication model with these pre-K students is where I believe I've made the most impact we all know how important early intervention is, and I now live that early intervention every day firsthand, and I can tell you as a professional working with these young children, it is the most impactful I have been able to be. I have helped each and every one of my students be able to communicate more effectively. I've watched parents and grandparents cry at IEP meetings after helping their son or daughter go from unintelligible speech in August to being understood by Christmas. Nothing is more rewarding than to be able to make that big difference in our community. 
please don't take this service away. A regular classroom teacher cannot offer what this classroom can offer or an ESC classroom. I invite each and every one of you to come and visit our amazing children in their communication classroom. If these cuts do take place, approximately 400 <laughs> pre-K students with phonological and varying speech disorders will be impacted. I worry about the backlash that will happen when these unintelligible, unintelligible students enter kindergarten without the intensive services that this communication model can offer. <clears throat> speech intelligibility will not improve. The research shows us that these students may suffer in the future with reading difficulties, frustration, self-esteem, and among other school-related problems. Palm Beach County Mission Statement says, it is committed to providing a world-class education with excellence and equity to improve each student to reach his or her highest potential with the most effective staff to foster the knowledge, skills, and ethics required to, res to be responsible citizenship and productive and have productive careers. If these cuts take place, the communication model pre-K students will certainly not be a part of the mission statement offered by Palm Beach County Schools. And I thank you from the bottom of my heart for all of your time and energy that you give towards our children. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Muhammad. Um, Carl Muhammad, um, I want to say good evening team players as we continue to make these transitions and make these different moves with the players that are on our team. I'm, it's a, I'm sorry to see you go, Mr. Avosa, but I'm also happy to see <coughs> Mr. Fenoy as he uh, take place. But I will always like to bring to your remembrance the, the lowest part of your educational system, which is African non-immigrant blacks inside of your system. And we've been for the longest since 1994 been crying out to try to get some attention drawn to it. Florida Statute 1003.42, which is supposed to be not just a course of study, but it's supposed to be across all disciplines and all grade levels, and we haven't seen any activity, at least I haven't, uh, relative to that kind of idea. I know constantly we're talking about the idea of equity, but we haven't seen to be able to report to the African-American community where exactly that you're taking our children. I know where we've been. For years, we were proclaiming that uh, Palm Beach County was an A-rated school district, and we saw as evidence of that that we got a report that we were only graduating 22% of African-American boys. And since such time, I know we've been boasting on the fact that we are supposedly moving graduation forward, but I uh, humbly and respectfully say to you that there's a body of knowledge that is supposed to be introduced into our community and to the educational realm that is not being there. I know Dr. Robinson give her black history moment at the beginning of most of the school board meetings, but that's a whole body of knowledge that we are neglecting that African American children and other children need in order to really improve the quality of education in the whole educational realm. And when Dr. Obosa came to uh, Palm Beach County, I introduced him to this book. It's called Walk in the Equity Talk. It's for courageous um, leaders that are in the educational realm. And I think Dr. John Robert Brown is one of the most proficient individuals that I've seen to discuss the idea of equity because most people, when you ask yourself right now, what do equity mean to you? Most of the time we are not really proficient in what that means. And as we move forward, I'm hoping that we are going to become a world-class educational opportunity for all students and it's going to be effective and relevant in the instructions and the needs of all students. And right now, we're not at that level. And if it's possible, I hope that somebody on the day us would try to accumulate some kind of information so that we can have a clear understanding of what our relationship is with the community. I know I have a lot of people talking about their speaking for the African-American community, but I think there are those of us who have been actually on the ground and doing the work. We would love to hear from you. I don't know who's going to be responsible for that with your changes, but I'm hoping that before this school year is out, possibly we might be able to get some information relative to that kind of idea. Now, thank you for your time. Thank you. Karen Holm, <laughs> Sherry Hillman, Edith Pride. Hi, I'm Karen Holm. I'm president of For Better Education. It's a nonprofit that provides advocacy. 
Um, I spoke with you last time. Um, this time my topic is warm bodies. After I spoke to your staff regarding special education funding, I did what all successful companies do, and I asked the employees for their opinions. I asked your teachers about what they need to what they need in order to accomplish their job. I'm going to give you some of their input today, but I'm not going to tell you their names or their school because they fear retaliation. Here's what they said. When I describe the idea of more staff being readily available to directly serve our students' needs, one teacher said, I'm a teacher and what you have just described would be my dream. Another said, I would love to be able to actually co-teach as an ESE teacher next to a general ed teacher and spend more than 25 minutes in a class. Quote, another said, reduce the size of my classes so I can spend more time with each individual student. Another said, hire more guidance counselors so the ones I count on can really work with my students instead of spending all of their time on routine, mundane, and mindless tasks. Here's another teacher. Some classes are so big I spend more time triaging behavior than anything. Warm bodies, I love their language, Warm bodies to lend a hand would be a tremendous benefit to the classroom. Thank you for bringing this issue to a school board member. This is exactly what we need in our schools to engage children and keep them feeling like they belong. Another teacher called me, too afraid to put anything in writing, and talked to me about what she called an inclusion class. It is one-third ESOL children, one-third ESE children, and one-third the lowest quartile children. You may, some of you may remember me talking with you a couple years ago about this. Uh, that classroom that this teacher described has no support facilitator, no ESOL facilitator. If that's not bad enough, the ESOL kids who used to have the opportunity to understand and communicate a little bit in English, uh, they're not. They don't even understand any English. Uh, my last comment is, did you know that the district cut out the communication model for three to five year olds? But I think that lady already took care of that. Um, I didn't know that. I do now. Please let's increase our allocations for ESE teachers, regular teachers, counselors, social workers, and psychologists to provide the direct services to our children that they need. Let's be proactive about our students' mental health and well-being. Please, let's get this discussion on the agenda. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Marsha Levinson, Elise Montgomery, Dylan Newton-Reither. I am Marsha Levinson. I am a Palm Beach County resident. My grandchildren attend Jupiter. I live in gardens. Thank you for hearing me, board and staff. My clergyman, the first sermon after Parkland, said we must become involved. We must be active. Because of my background, and I'm not here to give you my resume. Because of my background, I target in on curriculum. And I target in on curriculum to educate our future voters and to help mental health. I will first deal with the future voters. I do not know. I was offered the opportunity to ask this question directly through the e email, I chose not to. I do not know if your middle school provides basic civic education for how our government works, what taxes do, the legislation, fed, uh, the various balance of power, and federalism. I do know that you have to follow up on high school. In high school, the most important things that I think should be is how the justice system works, what Supreme Court cases are example, and the most important thing on that 
is that we are the only country in the world that has our defendants innocent before proven guilty. Now on to the mental health issue. Education with teenagers' minds is very, very important. And the newest study says that hormonal and intellectual doesn't completely make an adult until 19. Why am I bringing this up? Pranks individually plus group, not just bullying, needs to be stressed. Pranks individually not followed through lead to group, and groups lead to, I'm hesitating which one to use first, lead to violence and felonies. I hope that it has some effect on what our curriculum does in teaching not just bullying, but the effect of ignored pranks. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Dylan Utenreiter, Jennifer Utenreiter. Good evening. My name is Dylan and I am in my first year of middle school. You might remember me from the last school board meeting. Tonight I would like to talk about teachers having, in, having guns in their classroom. This is a terrible idea and should not happen. The school needs to use other measures of security. Last time I was here I spoke about elementary school students also having badge and badges and using their badges to swipe in to get to school. Other people talked about uh, more police presence, metal detectors, one point of entry with cameras and so on. I would, I would not feel safe and I would be scared sitting in a classroom, sitting in a class knowing my teachers had a gun in the classroom. A teacher could accidentally leave the gun out on the desk or somewhere else and, stu and a student could pick up that gun, play with it and accidentally shoot someone or shoot themselves. And what about the student who has mental health issues or the student who is bullied? That student might be able to take a gun from the teacher and shoot other students in the classroom. I have asked some of my teachers and my fellow students if they would feel safe if in, in the classroom if, they had, if their teachers had guns, and they've all said no. And those, those, these are some of the reasons why teachers should not have guns, and all of my teachers have said no, and two people said they would feel safe, and two people did not answer and my fourth period teacher quotes, the, the, the greatest times in history are the times of peace. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good evening. My name is Jennifer, and I spoke at the last school board meeting. There were many great suggestions at the last meeting as to how security can be improved upon in our schools. Metal detectors, swiping student badges, scanning all parents' IDs, elementary students wearing badges, one point of entry with cameras, higher fences, and more police presence on school grounds. I'm sure that most of these measures of security will be costly, but are they more costly than students and teachers losing their lives? How many more people have to die before some of these suggestions for improved security come to fruition? You can start by having all elementary school students wear badges. Middle school and high school students wear badges, so I'm not sure why elementary school students don't have badges. There needs to be more police presence at the schools indefinitely. After the shooting at Marjorie Stone Douglas High, police presence was more prevalent at many schools. This has died down and is back to what it was at most schools before the shooting. We need to start somewhere, and maybe the least costly improvements for increased security will be higher fences, badges for elementary school students, and more, more police presence every single day. Thank you. Thank you very much. David Frazier, Marnie Thomas, Rayleigh Mincenteff.
Good evening. My name is Rayleigh Mezenseff, and I'm a parent of two children in separate schools in this district. I have with me Michelle Michaels and Christine Searcher, who are both licensed psychotherapists, and we would like to present a comprehensive and preventative plan working in tandem with the Never Again campaign to ensure that our schools are safe. Because the funding for education has been significantly reduced, we are drafting a petition to submit to Tallahassee for additional funding to be earmarked specifically for this program. Our emphasis is ensuring the safety while maintaining the traditional learning and nurturing environment without the militarist, militaristic and prison-like approach. We believe that arming teachers, increasing police presence is not psychologically conducive for optimal learning. Our plan is a two-pronged strategy. The first, is a sophisticated, technologically advanced security and surveillance system that is invisible to the students. And the second, a clinical wellness hub in each school. I have been designing smart homes for over a decade. I know for a fact that with the hit of one button, a classroom or a building or an entire school can be on immediate lockdown within a few seconds without anyone having to move towards the door, risking their lives. With an advanced system, security sensors and fire sensors in every building on a campus must be under active surveillance and managed remotely and with a fail-safe redundancy off-site. It should be able to identify immediately and visually confirm when a sensor is triggered or if an exit door has been propped open and who is responsible for that breach. Students should be provided with a radio frequency ID that is able to identify and, lo and locate each individual when necessary. This also is helpful when the system identifies someone without this ID. Example, an intruder. The second strategy is a clinical wellness hub. Fact, the children had an idea of what was going on and we missed it. Fact, indicators and warning signs were overlooked and not checked on by current mental health system. Fact, we need drastic change in the system. We believe the schools are where it needs to begin and end. Our idea is to bring all funding and medical health services into the school. The schools are the one who know the children the best and have the most spent time with the children. We believe it needs to be kept in-house. We need a cutting edge model that corresponds with the need of our students and the changing cultural realities. This model must be designed and implemented accordingly. The outdated community mental health system external from the school does not assist in identifying, supporting, and intervention where needed. The model that fits the current reality would consist of a clinical wellness hub with trained mental health professional, case managers, educational experts within the schools. Thank you very much. No. No. Thank you. Next. Thank you. Jamie Marcus, Felice Racenstein, Helen Luce. <laughs> Katia Reiser, Reiser, Sarah Marzell, Ken Bush. Hello, my name is Jamie Marcus, and I'm the parent of a sophomore at Spanish River High School. I am on the executive board of the PTSA, and I chair the Health and Safety Commission Committee. Back in the fall, I think it was in November, I expressed concerns about the shortcomings with security at many schools in the immediate vicinity of my child's school, with emphasis on Spanish River. This was months before I was informed that out of the 185 or so schools in the district, River was considered among the top three in lack of security. I emailed and called everyone, from Dr. Avosa to Chief Leon. Dr. Avosa forwarded my e email to a group of district people. I received no replies. This was back in November, I want to remind you. Chief Leon also never replied to any of my calls or any of my emails. 
I met with, mo with both Mr. Latson and eventually Dr. Sheffield. I'm confident that if you spoke with Mr. Latson, he too would echo these concerns. Our principal funded police aides with money that could have been used for instruction, but the school police have not been able to provide them. He has been trying to get police aid since last summer to no avail. Dr. Sheffield and I spoke at length about the lack of security issues, specifically at River. I mentioned to her that when I'd recently entered into a government building in this county, I needed to go through metal detectors and had my bags checked. I asked her why our government workers were considered more precious than our kids. I concluded our meeting with, are we waiting for a catastrophic event to make changes? Well, sadly, we don't have to wait any longer for that. This was all brought to your attention several months ago in a proactive way, and unfortunately, we're now in a reactive situation. We need to leave here today with solutions to the issues we face. This is about protecting the integrity of the safety of our most precious commodities, our kids. We need to leave here with answers and compromises that meet shared interests. We need to speak to the challenges we face and work together in col collaboration as a team to solve these issues. I'm confident that we can do this. Our children need us too. They look to us to protect them, to tell them that they are safe when they get out of our cars or off of the bus every day, that we have put them in a place that is safe, as safe as we can make it. There are no quick solutions, but there are things we can immediately do working together. After our group speaks, you'll be given a handout of some ideas we have come up with. Most either cost nothing or will be funded by our PTSA. Please use us, your students' parents. We're here to help. Thank you. Hi, my name is Felice, and I am a mom of two kids in Spanish River High School. Before I begin, I want to acknowledge that this is not what any of us signs up for as parents or educators. We are facing a challenge that should not be part of any playbook in a normal world. I want to acknowledge the efforts of our principal, Mr. Latson, who is doing all he can, but he needs help. I'm a parent of two children in a school district that has made insignificant changes, changes since 17 innocent people were randomly slaughtered in Parkland, and I am terrified. I feel like a horrible mother because every day when my kids say goodbye, when they get out of the car, I ask myself if today is the day that terror will occur. Every day this happens, yet I still drop them off at the curb. I feel this way because neither of my kids has the foggiest idea of what to do in, in case of an attack on the school. If you ask them, each will give you a different response of what they would do. Their responses are so different, but to totally thought through. If 2,500 students all do their own thing in an emergency, what in the world does that look like? This is what makes me cry as I leave them at school. <laughs> when you get on an airplane or have, take a cruise, the, order, the first order of business is safety. <laughs> you are given instructions about what to do in an emergency. These trips are daily occur these trips are not daily occurrences. However, our children go to school every day and have no guidance as to what they are to do in case of a shooting. We teach our children about making good choices, setting priorities, and following principles. But we are not, are not making the safety of the people we care about most a priority. At this point, shouldn't their safety be our first priority? Our kids spend hours every day at school learning about everything but safety. Who is responsible for the safety plan of action in case a shooter comes on our campus? Where is this plan? And will the plan be implemented before or after the next catastrophe? Oh my God. Why isn't there a temporary plan being implemented right now? something to practice so that in the time comes, people in the school, not just the kids, the administrators, the teachers, do something that's planned and organized instead of random survival tactics. When are we going to change our priorities so that our schools are prepared for the next attack? 
Thank you. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you for having us. My name is Helen Luce. I have a junior of Spanish River High School, and I, my son is a sixth grader autonomous, Don Estridge. And I was a substitute teacher for over five years for the school district. There are fundamental core pillars that are related to creating school, safe school environments, mental health support, training, security, and systems. We feel that it's imperative that a new norm be established. Mental health. Detecting early warning signs for students is a precursor to knowing and identifying potential issues and concerns early on. And establishing protocols and appropriate infrastructure to support mental health in an expedited manner is also very <coughs> crucial. Training. Our teachers are the first line of defense in protecting our children while on campus. We entrust them with our most precious commodity we need to prepare them proactively with the training that is necessary to assess and handle during chaos and protocols as our children look to them for answers. Security. Whether it's an airport or even a jewelry store, we are familiar with seeing armed law enforcement. We need to employ armed law enforcement on each campus in the district. And the ratio should commensurate not only with the student body, but also with the layout of the campus. We need to secure our campuses given that they're open air and were established at a time when these acts of violence, like we've seen, were not an issue. Systems. It's not about purchasing systems, but buying the right ones to support our efforts and creating more safety nets on our campuses to detect, deter, and act. I don't think any of us really thought we were gonna be here to talk about this, but we have to act together, and we as parents, we're here to help. We're here to work together with you to make our children safe at school. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Katya Reisler. I'm a parent of a high school student at Spanish River. We greatly appreciate the effort that the district has made to provide a greater focus on social emotional learning and more mental health support in the schools, but we need even more. We need strong mental health programs in every school so that all children will be able to reach their potential. Our schools are uniquely situated to provide mental health prevention, education, and intervention and to provide connections to mental health service and providers. As you know, early intervention and prevention can help to address a child's behavioral and mental needs before symptoms develop into more damaging social, emotional, or academic behaviors or activities. A school counselors, a school psychologists, a school social workers, and a school nurses all play an essential role in providing crisis intervention and mental health services for students. Having the best practice ratio of school-based mental health professionals to students in a school is critical to making every child's potential a reality. The American School Council Association recommends a ratio of one to 250 students. Unfortunately, in our district, I have seen ratios of one to 600 or even one to 1,100. Our school counselors and other mental health professionals simply do not have enough time to make sure that the students do not slip through the cracks. We need this to change. Furthermore, we need mental health intervention, <coughs> prevention, programs, and services to include a strong family, youth, and community engagement component. We need more programs such as peer mentors training by NAMI. The students have shown that when mental health prevention and intervention programs are coordinated with families and communities, they are likely to be more effective than standalone programs. We ask that as you further develop better and more programs in our districts, you include community partners and our families. We are here to help. And we know there is help out there. We need to try to reach out in a different way. 
Thank you for your time. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Sarah Merzell, and I'm the PTSA president at Omni Middle School and vice president of fundraising at Spanish River. I have two children in this school district, one at Omni and one at Spanish River High School. Following the many tragedies to date in our country, we've learned a new norm in our culture. After 9-11, many people decided not to fly. Why? Because the experience of flying was so frightening, a horrible experience that no one should be subjected to. Since then, we have given permission to be searched, screened, and patted down. We've done this in every facet of our lives, but not in our schools. The time has come. Our kids do not have a choice. They have to go to school. It is completely unacceptable that we ask them to attend school every day without giving them the sense that they are safe. Without taking these measures on, can any one of you sitting here say that you feel you've done everything you can to protect my child or the other's children? We've invested all of our life savings to live in this school district, to send our kids to these schools, and to purchase our homes to afford them this incredible education that Palm Beach County has to offer. <clears throat> Yet, our county and our government have failed us. We don't meet, we don't, we don't meet new norms and, sorry, we don't meet the new norms and security and systems to create every reasonable measure to best protect the integrity of safety in our schools. Can any of you look at me in the face? Should this happen at my school? If you haven't, if you haven't taken those measures of installing security cameras, panic buttons, doors that lock, and a lockdown campus, can you look at me in the eyes and say you've done everything you can without installing systems to detect, deter, and act? Can anyone sitting here say with absolute confidence that we are putting our children in a safe environment? It's merely a building with walls and windows. We need to act now because no one knows the next time a tragedy will happen. It's time to be proactive versus reactive. Amongst the safety measures I'm handing out, some cost nothing and others cost something. When you break it down, cost a child, we are talking about nominal amount, amounts. How can we put a price tag on saving the lives of our children and our teachers and our staff in our schools? In addition to security measures installed on campuses, we need Firefly. I brought Ken Rush with, with me here to speak to you more, to give you more information about that. Thank you, have a nice evening. All right. <clears throat> All right. Hello, my name is Ken Rush. I need her an extra 10 seconds to make a comment. I sighed when uh, the chairman said that it was gonna take three hours for speakers tonight <clears throat> until I realized that some kids sat in closets for five hours waiting to get shot. Um, I've been in the security business for 40 years, designed, planned, more than 500 school systems, university systems, airport systems, worked after 9-11 and doing various things. Heard a thousand plans being proposed. One of the things that happened after 9-11, there were many, many different plans with different aspects involved in them but they all had a common denominator. And that was scan the passengers to make sure they didn't have a gun getting on the plane and a bomb in their bag. Nobody waited for the plans to be finalized before implementing those systems. They were immediately put into place. And after Sandy Hook, the Department of Energy developed a system called Emergency Automatic Gunshot Lockdown System, EGLE. It was evolved with a grant from the government, uh, from the Army, to work for schools. It's very, very simple, and in my opinion, it has to be deployed. It's installing golf ball device size devices around the school. These devices here analyze if there's a gunshot goes off within 15 seconds and passes that information to first responders. It picks up cameras, access control systems, and everything else, and immediately gives that information to first responders who can push it down to people on the ground. 
15 seconds, I can know that somebody just shot a 45. I can get a video of them, and I can track them. I can lock doors to stop students running into the line of fire, and I can isolate the shooter. This was developed just like systems prior to 9-11. Many airports looked at metal detection systems and bag scanners, but they never did anything about it. Now they're everywhere. This system was developed after Sandy Hook. Schools have not picked up on it. Now they have to. I made a very quick calculation on a budget. It would cost about 20 cents per student per month in this district. And I think I've spent the last three weeks talking to school districts, police chiefs, and everybody else. It's a simple, effective way to get, find out whether there's a shooter in my building within 15 seconds. If it happened here right now, if there was a shooter outside right now, we'd know within 15 seconds, but more importantly, the guys with the guns, the good guys, would know where to go and how to react. Thank you. <laughs> Sherry Hungerford, Karen Lampert, Sienna Lampert, Jada Lampert. Hi, my name is Karen Lampert, and I already spoke at the last school board meeting. I mean, how can I top that off? I think this gentleman already said everything we wanted to say. I'm so amazed by that. Um, it's only going to take me a few seconds. Um, I, the thought of having armed teachers in my children's schools is um, terrifying to me. So many things can happen. Um, I know, I personally know that the teachers, most teachers, don't feel safe being armed and um, like my friend's son already said, other kids could grab the gun. Oh, things can always happen. So I just, I, I can't even think of that. Um, I also, I'm begging you guys to have more armed police officers on the kids' school grounds, um, panic buttons for the teachers and um, of course metal detectors because like everybody else said, we have it at the airports, we have it at a courthouse, everywhere else, so why not at our precious um, children schools? I have four children in the school district and um, we work very hard to pay our taxes, so please use the money wisely. Thank you. <laughs> My kids are very oh, nervous. Go ahead. Go ahead. Why am I going? <laughs> I thought this was looking longer. <laughs> All right. Good evening, my name is Sienna Lampert and I'm a ninth grader at Atlantic Community High School. I would not like to, I would not like to see teachers armed. The problem is guns. Why add more guns to try and cancel out the problem? That's basic math. You don't add one plus one and get zero. Um, what I would like to see though is more police officers on campus and more protection around school campuses. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Sherry Hungerford. I have three kids that attend school in Palm Beach County and I'm here tonight to continue the conversation of school safety. Now that the school bill has passed, I ask the board for the following so that our schools can be safe and secure learning environments that they were designed for. Multiple armed sworn in police officers at every school assigned by square footage of the school. I'm vehemently opposed to arming our teachers as this is unfair and extremely unsafe on so many levels. Automatic locked doors throughout all buildings and classrooms. Activated ID badges, key access cards for all staff and all students to be worn around next, including the elementary school level. Live, real-time school surveillance throughout all areas of the schools that is consistently monitored throughout the day by assigned personnel and feeds into the local police department or Palm Beach School Police Department. We need to de detect and prevent tragedy before it occurs, not just view recordings after the fact teacher panic buttons in every classroom that feed into the school police or sheriff's office, bulletproof glass for all windows, regular school drills and training for staff and students, 
standardized safety protocols across all schools and stricter enforcement of these protocols. And this I ask for now, not at the beginning of next school year, require the creation of safety task forces for every school which designates specific staff members to each building or section of school campus throughout the day, not just during drop off and dismissal. Cross check doors, gates, and any other access point throughout the day. Enforce consequences for staffers who neglect a safety protocol. Require frequent random campus safety checks by principal or assigned task force members from the district on a monthly, even weekly basis. Make it known to all staffers that the campus will be tested randomly and make the consequences clear. We should not stumble across one unlocked door at our schools while our kids are on campus. I did just yesterday. While attending a school conference, I walked right into the front office through someone who held the door while exiting, walked through double unlocked doors to the campus, and right into an unlocked door of the building that I was having my conference in, and right past all of the classrooms. I mean, this is just four weeks after Parkland. And this was on a day that was voting. We had voting at our school, so the general public was walking on campus, and this was 1.15 in the afternoon. These protocols need to be strictly enforced for before and aftercare as well. For years, I've walked into an unlocked door to the aftercare office before the buzzer was, uh, because the buzzer was inconvenient. I still hear this all the time. I hate that damn buzzer. After speaking up, a week after Parkland happened, they finally started locking the, the doors for um, pickups, and the parents have to be buzzed in. The inconsistency of simple security measures right now is concerning. Without, without the funds, I just feel like this is something that's just common sense and needs to happen now. Okay, thank you very much. Hi, my name is Jada, and I'm a fifth grader. Um, I've been here on the school board and I was talking here last time and I feel as we shouldn't arm the teachers because it would scare most students here at my school. I would also like more than one police officer protecting our school. I would also like to have school IDs and if no ID students would have parents called to take them home. Also I would only like to have one entrance for the school. I'm a safety patrol and I want more kids safe so I want metal detectors for our school, and if airports can have them, then so can our schools. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Andy Goldstein, Erica Wright, Shoya Reed. Good evening, my name is Andy Goldstein. I'm a teacher at Omni Middle School, a member of the Palm Beach County Classroom Teachers Association, and the lead CTA rep and chair of the Employee Building Council at our school, speaking as an individual. I'm also the proud parent of a 10-year-old daughter who attends fourth grade at one of our public elementary schools. At Omni Middle School, one month after the shootings at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School, teachers are scared for the safety of their students and for themselves. We need a secure campus. Work orders have been placed with the district. Will we see the district act on the work orders? We don't know. We do know that one request that we brought up after the shootings at Sandy Hook Elementary School to make our campus more secure still has gone unfulfilled. A few years after Sandy Hook, I asked our school police officer about our request. He said it was so down the list of district priorities that it was unlikely to ever get filled. Five years after the shootings at Sandy Hook and one month after the shootings at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School, we still do not have a secure perimeter. Our teachers have been meeting to discuss school safety. We feel the fierce urgency of now to address the shortcomings. We want the district to feel the same fierce urgency of now. In the immediate term, say over spring break, we can have a secure perimeter for a nominal to modest cost if the district will act on the work orders we have submitted. After that, we need a single entry point to the main office. This would be a construction project, but the district has done far larger construction projects at our school, adding an entire building for additional classrooms. I have a list here of work orders 
uh, submitted and other issues teachers have pointed out that I would like to give to a staff person after my talk. Beyond a secure perimeter and a single entry point, we need as a district and as a community to make our school and every school a worthwhile place for kids to be. Kids are more than data points and they are more than pawns for profits for various vendors and agendas. High stakes testing has sucked the oxygen and joy out of our classrooms, turning our schools into test prep factories and is disenfranchising a whole generation of students from knowing the love and joy of learning. And district-wide, our guidance counselors need to be able to interact with our students to help them rather than be kept busy with lunchroom duties, testing duties, and a whole host of activities that severely limit them from helping those kids that really need help. At Omni, many of our teachers fear that the district won't act to secure our campus until a tragedy happens. We ask, we, we ask that the district embrace the fierce urgency of now and act to secure our campus and to bring back the joy of teaching and learning and caring in all our schools. Thank you. Hi, my name's Erica Wright. Um, I'm a member of District 4. I live in Old Northwood. I am here to represent Eagle Arts Academy and I have made a choice as a parent that lives all the way east to drive my children all the way to Wellington every day. It is a big commitment. As a single parent, it's not exactly an easy thing to do. Um, my ex-husband helps as much as he can, but he lives in Broward County. So, and when we moved up here in the middle of 2014 in the school year, we went to Palm Beach Maritime, which was not a good fit for my children. Um, parents have mentioned that their kids don't fit in the box. I have one that's very academically easy for him. One, she's not a box person. She's creative. She likes to do things on the grandeur. Um, she did a piece in Lake Worth uh, two weekends or three weekends ago that was 10 feet by 10 feet that she had support of the faculty of the school and of course me and her father. And it is a place that has allowed her to grow. It has allowed her to be who she is. And I know you sit there and you say this is all about financials. And Mr. Avosa, that's something you have hounded really hard tonight. Um, I have Greg's number on his cell phone number on my phone. I have a communication with the school. I contact the assistant principal and the principal of the school whenever I need 24 hours a day. They are an open book to us parents. If we want to know something, they are willing to give it to us. And like another parent said, we're in the growing pains. Any new business, I'm an entrepreneur, that's the background I come from, that's the education I have. Any new business takes years to get going and to become financially profitable. We have had some challenges. Um, some of the wonderful letters that have been written in the Palm Beach Post have really not helped our student enrollment, which as we know as a charter school, we need student enrollment to have the funding to pay for our bills. We haven't felt um, that that has really helped in keeping the student enrollment going and bringing more kids into the school. But I also want the school board to look and say we need to help this place. You see a lot of parents and students that are here advocating for this place. Not on the finances, but we're advocating for you guys to help us. Instead of taking us to a vote tonight, say, hey, let's sit down, let's figure out what we can do. Let's there are so many things. If you go onto your website, there are so many procedures and steps that could have happened before we got to this step. And I feel like this is kind of a drastic step that was taken, and I really want you guys to think and learn about Eagle Arts, and it is a great place for so many kids that need it. Thank you. Hello, I'm Ashoya Reed. I'm here on behalf of my two children that attend Eagle Arts Academy. Um, my son has been struggling all his elementary years um, with being bullied his entire elementary, traumatized by that he does not want to go to school. When he was supposed to attend middle school, I was in a panic. What am I gonna do with my child? Because he's like, mom, I refuse. I cannot do this. I come across Eagle Arts Academy, and I, he was as he attended um, Eagle Arts Academy his second year in middle school. Oh my gosh, my son wakes up every morning excited, wants to be at school, and I want to be at school, want to learn, and he's so eager. He needs friends, he loves his teachers, 
And my daughter, who is um, an elementary school um, t student, she has, she's very artistic. So she does not fit into the box of what public school offer for her. So it was not working out because she fought behind because there was nothing there within public school to help her within her, to help her cope with what her artistic, to fit her artistic means basically. And um, so anyways, we end up moving all the way in Palm Beach Gardens. It's 30 minutes one way without traffic to get to school. And I make that sacrifice every single day. My kids do not miss a day of school unless they're severely sick. And I make that sacrifice, I bring my kids to school one way, 30 minutes, 30 minutes to get back home, 30 minutes again to pick them up, 30 minutes again to go back home. This is without traffic. But I make that sacrifice because I'll do anything to make my kids succeed. So my children have straight A's. My son is also on their spelling bee team that he's going to be doing on my birthday, March 29th, and I'm excited for that. <laughs> so with that being said, I am so disappointed. My son is, um, I'm doing my bachelor's for computer programming, and to be honest with you, Eagle Arts is teaching him that. I sit down and I can do my homework with my son. And he's like, Mom, wait, 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 no, that part is not right. Let's, and I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm turning in my homework, getting 100 based on help my son, who is 12 years old, helping me with my homework for doing my bachelor's degree. Hello? Listen, these people, Eagles Art Academy is making a difference, and I see it within my kids' grade, and I refuse to stand here or sit here today. Heather, Heather Farron, William Millard, Anya Mar Millard, and Dr. T.J. Morgan. Good evening, board members. Um, my name is Heather Farron. I'm a middle school social studies teacher at Eagle Arts Academy. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to speak to you tonight about the future of our school. I know that you have concerns, but I am hopeful that after hearing some of us tonight, you can reconsider what you know about us and further examine the caliber of school we represent. I've had the opportunity in these last three years to work with some of the most passionate people I know. We have had to overcome a lot of challenges together, but we have always remained focused on our students and sharing our passion for learning with them. I ask you today to please help us to continue to do that. Work with us to help keep our students, students from all across Palm Beach County, in a place where they are thriving and where they are learning. If you have doubts about that, please come to our classrooms. The environment of, at EAA has been conducive to student growth because our students feel safe and supported there. They believe, some of them for the first time, that they can be successful, and, that, and they are proving it. That is so powerful. That's so powerful that everything else to, to us simply becomes noise. At Eagle Arts, we're helping students navigate education and find new ways of learning that speaks to their learning styles and their interests. We are facilitating an environment that allows them to demonstrate their learning in new and creative ways, find their own voices, express their own ideas. 
Students who once believed that they were just not smart enough for school or that they've always had to overcome educational and learning difficulties, they've become engaged, they've become involved, they've become passionate. There's nothing more satisfying for a teacher than seeing students have that light bulb moment after they've struggled. I've seen light bulb moments happen at Eagle Arts because students have been given the freedom to learn and express through creative outlets. I've seen them learn standards and concepts using song, dance, videos, comic strips, story writing, art. They're involved, they're learning. And it's not about the warm fuzzies that we get from the benefits of arts, of ed of arts education. It's about the data. We all know that's what it comes down to. The data shows that they're learning, that they're making gains, that students who have previously plateaued are now moving upward. That data doesn't lie. It backs up our methods. It backs up our work. So with that in mind, we ask you to help us in our efforts to share and continue that work with our students and future students at Eagle Arts. Thank you.